Well, I'm here very early in the morning on a very windy day outside the Jaguar Daimler Heritage Trust building at the British Motor Museum here at Gaydon. And it's Jaguar Breakfast Club Day. All of the different car clubs are all positioned at the back there, including the Jaguar Enthusiast Club. And the special car of this meeting is the Jaguar XJ40. It's a model that epitomizes the Sir John Egan era of Jaguar. And I'm here to see one particular XJ40 that's very special indeed. And it's very special because of how it looks from the rear. Let's go and have a look. And here it is, a shooting brake XJ40. Now, Jaguar knew that they had to make an estate car at some point, and there had been various attempts over the years. There was even a private attempt, uh, of course, to base one on the XJS, the Lynx Eventer. And in fact, Sir William Lyons himself tried to make an estate with some bits of string and some experiments on his own Series 3 XJ6, but it wasn't until 1992 when the XJ40 shooting brake or estate car uh, really started to be worked on at Design and Engineering at Whitley. And here is the car. It is owned by the Jaguar Daimler Heritage Trust and it has not done any miles at all. It's been tucked away for nearly 20 years. It's recently been recommissioned, put back on the road with a partnership between the Jaguar Daimler Heritage Trust, the Jaguar Enthusiast Club and David Marks Garages. And David Marks, the expert on these cars, has recommissioned this car ready for a future life on the road. David, come and tell us what you've been doing to the car. But well, first of all, actually, tell yeah. us how long you've known the car. I've known this car since at least about 1995, maybe 1994. Um, my first real memories with it were more to do with taking it on a, a run to France with the first Entente Cordiale, <laughs> which was um, celebrated for 60 years of um, the anniversary of Jaguar, 1935 to 1995. We'd done um, Sir William Lyons' Jaguar XJ6 um, as a recommissioning project, it's the first one that we did, probably 93, 94. And then I took PHP, um, Graham Searle, the late Graham Searle, he took the Queen Mother's Mark VII and um, Nigel Thorley drove TAC and uh, off we all went to France and um, the only record of the car being taxed was 1995 and it would have been taxed for that time then basically so it could go across to France and come back. And I've still got my memento from that trip which is this um, plaque and there's wow. some pictures around of it so that you can see it and other things as well and that basically is the plaque there. Now this is the one off PHP, so that was my number rather than whatever number would have been on this. But this was it in conjunction with Jaguar, Jaguar World Magazine, etc., etc. So that was my first memory of it. And then with my relationship with the heritage, um, we'd seen the car a number of times over the years. I got various photographs of the car in my previous unit and also um, in our current unit as well. But the last time we saw this car was um, in November of 2005, so 19 years ago, all but, where it had a, a major service and a few other things done to it as well. I've got all the records of that. Um, at that time, it had 7,900 miles on the clock. And here we are, 19 years later, it's got 8,250 <laughs> on the clock now or something like that. Wow. So it has been nowhere. It must have been done for a reason at the time, some promotional events or what have you, probably driven on trade plates, but that was the last time it was used. And then in terms of how we got to where we are now with it standing here with a running driving vehicle after all these years, um, to say in conjunction with the, with obviously the heritage we wanted the car doing and we worked out a plan between us and the club to support it and do what we can, um, we've done quite a bit to already and it's still not a finished job to get it to the point where it could drive down here safely and legally because it is now MOT'd and fully taxed as well. It's a proper road legal car. But because it had been stood for so long, when we got it, it was a non-runner, so to change the fuel pump. The tyres on the car, the original tyres fitted in wow. 1992. <laughs> now, we still kept them for Neil to take back to the Heritage if he wants them, because they are exemplars of a 1992 Pirelli um, yeah, tyre. Sure. So, and the spare was brand new, never used. So we've got this brand new 30-plus year old um, spare tyre that we're still keeping at the moment. Um, but then we also had to go through the braking system and um, other items as well. Um, so right now it's got brand new brakes on the front um, we're still waiting on parts for the rear because getting some bits can be tricky for these and I've got to get rear calipers reconditioned it's going to take a couple of weeks but just before the MOT we realised the brakes weren't right and I thought they were just dead from lack of use until I, I actually realised that they had no rear brakes oh. um, yeah which just before an <laughs> MOT is not good no. uh, you might get away with a bulb going out but not run no rear brakes so we uh, by then I'd already ordered the flexes so we put the brake flexes on I never I've heard about it never had it in my life um, both rear brake flexes blocked or collapsed oh, yeah um, changed them and that was it job done um, 
So then at the front end, the suspension was knocking very, very badly and there is little foam bushes which collapse, very common thing. Most Jaguar owners will know all about that sort of thing. So we put those on, transform the front end. Um, one of the big jobs we've got remaining with the car is that the car is still on its original self-leveling suspension, hydraulic self-leveling suspension. And um, this was problematic back in the day. Yeah. And I actually recorded in 2005 that this car had suspension problems when I did that big service. And surprisingly, 20 years of sitting around hasn't fixed it. <laughs> Who would have thought? And expensive as well, isn't it, as a um, It's expensive to repair, and there's no guarantee of that repair. So the solution really, which is subject to discussion with the museum and the heritage, because you're taking away from originality, but if they want the car to be a, a practical and usable and reliable driver, the way around it really is to put it into non-self-leveling, sure. which we can do invisibly. So we can leave all the pipe work and the pump and everything in the engine. We can just remove the drive dog from the pump so it won't actually operate. We can even leave fluid in the reservoir so it looks like it's all full. And yet it'll be on standard suspension, which will transform the ride quality of, of, of the vehicle. Yeah. It's so, a testament to the car, really, isn't it? Yeah. That after 20 years of doing nothing and being sat there, really, it hasn't taken too much effort to put it back no, on No, it own. hasn't. We've got about um, 45 hours in it so far, what we've done. So we've greased all, stripped all the wheel bearings out, cleaned them, reassembled them, repacked them with grease and what have you. We've, um, and a lot of other stuff has been done, serviced the back end, drained the fluids, etc., etc. We've even changed some coolant hoses on it. Um, the ones that are vulnerable, I would not have wanted to drive it down on with two particular hosing because they're so prone to blowing, it's not real. And again, we'll look at whether we should change the rest of them as a matter of course. But these 40s, they're bulletproof. They're, they're, you yeah. know, you could nuke one of these and it would still <laughs> actually work. When we started this, after the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, after the first attempt at, um, we put the fuel pump in, which, which actually sits in the boot right at the back there, quite a stretch to get to it um, from on top of the tank. Um, basically, checked all the levels and what have you, um, turned the key and span it over for about maybe a couple of minutes on and off, on and off to get some oil pressure up and what have you. Started it, started on five cylinders, and then after about 30 seconds, the one sticking injector freed off and bingo, here we are. <laughs> She's awesome. And they're all like this. The, these are an amazing piece of engineering, these X340s, properly reliable and durable. Like all prototypes, you can't yep. help look at it and wonder what if, can yes, you really? Yes, there is that, certainly. This is a beautiful design, actually, of a sport brake version of the XJ40. Yep. Unfortunately, such was the nervousness in the market at the time in the early 90s, it never went into production. It was always going to be quite expensive for Jaguar to put into production. But do you think as a concept it works? Do you think it would have been a success had it gone into production? Um, I think it's quite possibly so, because there's always been a, a demand and a request for a Jaguar estate. Um, as has been mentioned and recorded, over the years, many individuals have, have built estate conversions, and something like the Humberston, of which three were made in the end. But more than that, you look at when the X-Type the X estate came out, actually how many of those were sold and how they did yeah. do the job. Yeah. And I think when you look at the, with the styling like this, I mean, really, I've been so involved with repairing this car that I haven't really looked at it for the last two or three weeks. <laughs> but when I was standing a bit further and looking at the back, it is a, a properly beautiful and well-proportioned yeah. shape yeah. with a very usable hatch as well. Now, you're hardly going to be the antiques remover of the year with this. It's not quite that size. But if you've got a couple of large dogs or you want to move some stuff around, you take the kids to university or something, this this would be a fantastic vehicle for it. Or and a week round France. Or a week proved. round France, exactly, <laughs> that's exactly it. And um, it's got the style, it's got the capacity, it's got the drivability, it's got the comfort. And unlike some estate cars, there's no boominess, there's no flexing right. in it. I'm not saying I've driven it hard, it's been an easy 70 mile an hour trip down the motorway from Nottingham to get here. But there's no real, there's no sign that the car is gonna be anything but properly planted on the road once this rear suspension is fully sorted. Um, and it's all there, and I think, yes, it, it's something that could work. I mean, look at the XF Sport Brake. I mean, that is, in essence, yes. you know, it, it almost, in, I imagine, in proportion, overall size of the vehicle, and, and even marketplace, you could argue, that is what this could have been, perhaps. Yeah. Um, but equally, Jaguar had a lot going on at the time. Um, XJ40 was going to run out. X300 was coming in. Um, where do you go from actually designing this on the XJ40 platform to then putting the architecture of the X300, which was a, an electrical and technological step up from the XJ40. There's, there's all these various things to deal with and consider. Um, the styling of the rear tail lamps, the whole back end is quite different than a 300 or 40. So 
you know, it's a very difficult one to say, where would you go, where would you not go? Many people ask me that question about the Corsica as well, and it's, it's the same thing. I'm sure it would have flown off the shelves, even at a six-figure sum in the 1990s, particularly in America. But the sheer amount of human effort at the time for a company the size of Jaguar to, to do that, and perhaps it was the same with this, could they really be assured of, of getting the return? Bearing in mind, this came out in February of 1992, so it was probably conceived mid-1991. And at that point, I guess, that the X300 must have been on the drawing board because yeah. that came out in 94. So you couldn't really do this. And then you've got the 394, you've got XK8 and all the V8 engine cars coming out in 96 that already would have been in motion as well. Yeah. So you've got to look at everything in the round. It's very easy yeah. to look back and say, it's brilliant, they should have done it. But there are still ways in which this is not a particularly finished article in some ways. The trimming is a little bit crude in places, it has to be said. The fitment of the glass, who would tolerate this sort of finish here yes, on a production uh, car? And before you know it, these are all one of, of two or three hundred little items that all have to be addressed, which I feel is why perhaps you know, these things don't always advance the way now, looking back as a, as a, um, um, a hue-eyed enthusiast just saying it should have been done, it should have been done. Absolutely. Well, the great thing about the Jaguar Daimler Heritage Trust is that these cars are in the collection, they're protected for the future, and of course, now, thanks to experts like you, David, they get to go out on the road and we'll get to see them moving and on the road. It must be a great privilege for you to be able to take these real icons of history from Jaguar's past and, and put them back on the road for the trust. It is. I have been incredibly fortunate. Um, I mean, you could argue in some ways you can make your own luck. What you see here is the end result of a lot of hours of work in between trying to run a garage as well. But not taking that, I, I feel genuinely privileged lucky, fortunate and every other word you want that we get the chance to, to work on these cars and obviously drive them as well. But yes, it has been a wonderful and fantastic opportunity over now some 30 years basically, which yeah. is quite astonishing in itself. Well, of course, readers of Jaguar Enthusiast magazine know you very well. Yep. Uh, you are one of our technical experts. And, of course, you fill those two pages every month of all of the Q&As that we get in from the readers. Um, great to have you here. And I know that we're going to be following more progress on this car over the future months. So yeah. what have you got planned? What is the work that's in store for this wonderful car? I have to discuss with Neil Campbell exactly what we do about the rear suspension, as I said, versus it has to be resolved. The car cannot be driven long distance or continually like it is because the common self-leveling faults are there. So we have to address that issue uh, one way or the other and, and it will be done. Um, there are a few more minor service items to deal with. There's a door open signal on the dashboard all the time. So one of these openings, be it the tailgate or one of the four doors, is showing a false signal. And there's an issue with some of the interior lighting coming on and going off as well. I noticed this morning when I pulled it out of the garage at half past five that the instrument pack is not lighting up um, um, unless you put the headlights on. There should be a backlight to it, which is not functioning. Um, then there is also some preventative maintenance to do with this in terms of we already had a problem with the engine electric cooling fans not working correctly which I traced to a corroded connection at one of the relay mounts <coughs> and I think 20 years of being washed regularly has perhaps taken its toll on some of the electrical connections like that but also at each corner of the car one two and three and four you have what's called a bulb fail module on these vehicles and it controls all the lighting at each respective corner and back in the day it was always a problem with these with failure of the solder joints and it was quite easy to remove them so resolder the joints, put them back in, job done, thank you very much. But what we found now, 20 years on, is that while some of them still have the failure of the dry joints, or the, the failed corroded joints, the dry joints as they're called for the solder, um, a problem now which is very much age-related is there are certain components within, inside these within these modules which are now failing, and when they fail, they actually cause the modules to burn out. Now, I'm not saying it's a bonfire about to start in the back of the car. I, I don't easily envisage how that could happen, but when they fail you'll get double time of the indicators a bulb fail warning on the dashboard and ultimately you actually get failure of some of the lighting whatever it might be at the corner so a preventative way of of dealing with this preventative maintenance way is to take out each module strip them down and replace the capacitors which are the problem that's in there and just just do that and we do that 
to many of the cars that come in now. I've done it to that one and D38 and what have you. So I keep all these things in stock. It's not a particularly big job. Each rear module's got two, and each front one's got about five or six or something like that. And this is solid state electrics. This is stuff you fix yeah. with a soldering iron. I mean, that's it. Well, I mean, we were, I mean, I was fixing these things in 1991 with a soldering iron then. That's exactly the, the instrument packs on the early cars that used to give out. I mean, these are a properly and thoroughly reliable, durable, efficient and usable motor car. Yeah. They got a bad rep through as always, ignorance. I know you're a triumph man in your day. Look at the TR6 fuel injection. Yeah, sure. Not a complicated system, but yeah. nobody bothered to learn it, yeah. and therefore the system was always bad. Yeah. And it's yeah. the same with these, unfortunately. Yeah. So I reckon you know we have well and truly broken the back of this, this um, job um, to do it, to get it here. So these cars are extremely durable and reliable and efficient and usable cars. They're a proper practical classic to be used these days. They can cope with the roads, they can cope with the conditions and the traffic and everything else that goes with it. And they're also fairly easeable, easy to maintain and fix and repair, even down to the electronics that we discussed, because they're that age of thing where things can be fixed and repaired. So you can also argue that they're good for the environment and good for the planet as well. I like that. Sustainable for the future. Sustainable David. for the future. Well, the impact in making these cars is long gone. And the fact is that you don't just take something out and throw it away. You take it out, repair it, put it back in again. Absolutely. So there we are, the XJ40, a brilliant car. Well, of course, a lot of the problems that you're going to be solving with this car are common to the problems that you'll probably solve if you have a car in long-term storage as well. 20 years locked in a barn, no problem at all, obviously, to get these back on the road. And you can follow the progress of David Marks putting this car back on the road, picking up on all those little jobs he just mentioned in the coming months in Jaguar Enthusiast magazine, of course, the publication of the Jaguar Enthusiast Club.